chapter two of the forbidden way by george gibbs this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tony oliva camilla her pupils had all been dismissed for the day and the schoolmistress sat at her desk a half-written letter before her gazing out through the open doorway over the squalid roofs of the residence section of mesa city the watch us grow sign on the false front over jeff ray's office was just visible over the flat roof of the brick bank building watch us grow the shadow in her eyes deepened for two long years she had seen that sign from doorway and window of the school and even when she went home to mrs brennan's bungalow up above she must see it again from the veranda jeff's business card was the most prominent object in town except perhaps jeff himself it was so much larger than it had any right to be out of scale so vulgar so insistent so so like jeff jeff had stood in the doorway of the schoolhouse while they were building his office and in his masterful way had told her of the trademark he had adopted for his business he wanted it in plain sight of her desk so that she could see it every day and watch mesa city and himself fulfil the prophecy that seemed ages ago now it was before the jeff ray had been painted out and ray and berkeley put in its place before larry came out or Cortland bent in the days when jeff was a new kind of animal to her when she had arrived fresh from her boarding school in kansas watch us grow how could anyone grow in a place like this grow anything at least but wrinkled and stale and ugly the sign had been a continual mockery to her a travesty on the deeper possibilities of life which fate had so far denied her she shut her eyes and resolutely turned her head away but she could not get jeff ray out of her mind she was thoroughly frightened his air of proprietorship so suddenly assumed yesterday and the brutality of his kiss had brought her own feelings to a crisis for she had learned in that moment that their relationship was impossible but her fingers tingled still at the memory of the blow she had given him she had promised to marry him when he made good but in mesa city that had seemed like no promise at all how could any one succeed in anything here she leaned forward on the desk and buried her face in her hands what chance had she where was the fairy prince who would rescue her from her hut and broth kettle she raised her head at the sound of a voice and saw Cortland bent's broad shoulders at the open window morning he said cheerfully you look like ariadne deserted may i come in she nodded assent and thrusting her school books and unfinished letter in the desk turned the key viciously in its lock aren't you writing to-day he asked from the doorway no he came forward set on the top of one of the small desks facing her and examined her at his ease you're peevish no what yes i'm in a frightful mood you'd better not stay he only laughed up at the sunflower dangling from the water pitcher oh i don't mind i've a heavenly disposition how do you show it she broke in impetuously every man thinks the one way to get on with a woman is to make love to her no not altogether he reproached her you and i have had other topics you know swinburne and shakespeare and the musical glasses oh yes but you always drifted back again how can you blame me 
if i've made love to you it was oh i know i'm a rustic and it's a good game you're the least rustic person i've ever known he said seriously it's not a game i can't think of it as a game it is something more serious than that he took a few paces up and down the aisle before her and then went on i know you've never been willing to give me credit for anything i've said when i've tried to show you how much you were to me and yet i think you cared you've showed it sometimes but i've tried to go about my work and forget you because i thought it was best for us both but i can't camilla i tell you i can't get you out of my head i think of something else and then in a moment there you are again elusive mocking scornful tender all in a breath and then when i find you're there to stay i don't try any more i don't want to think of anything else he leaned across the desk and seized one of her hands with an ardor which took her by storm you've got into my blood like wine camilla to be near you means to reach forward and take you the sound of your voice the response of your eyes the appeal of your mind to mine in this wilderness of spirit i can't deny them i don't want to deny them her head sank but she withdrew her hands and my sanity she asked clearly that does not appeal to you perhaps it does most of all it maddens me too that i can't make you care for me enough to forget yourself she looked up at him smiling gently now it is easy to say forget myself that you may have one more frail woman to remember am i so provincial cortland bent am i really so rustic two days ago you were telling me i had all the savoir-faire of the great lady he did not reply to that but while she watched him he got up and walked slowly over to the map of the united states which hung between the windows i don't suppose it will mean anything to you when i tell you i'm going he said bitterly going where east for long for good i've leased the mine she started up from her chair breathless and stood poised on the edge of the platform the slender fingers of one hand grasping the projecting edge of the desk you're going east to to stay he did not turn and if he noticed any change in her intonation he gave no sign of it i've finished here the mine is leased i'm going back to new york i can't believe you never told me it's curious you shouldn't have said something before why should i no man likes to admit that he's a failure you've leased the lone tree to whom to ray he made me a proposition yesterday i've accepted it in fact i'm out of the thing altogether jeff i don't understand why only yesterday he was it loyalty to jeff that made her pause he turned quickly what did he say anything oh nothing only that the mine was a failure that seems curious if he has decided to lease it oh he said smiling it's only ray's way of doing business when anything is hanging fire he always says exactly what he doesn't mean he doesn't worry me i've gone over that hole with a fine-tooth comb and i'm glad to get out of it and out of mesa city then with an attempt at carelessness of course we'll all miss you she said dully don't you mustn't speak to me in that way i've always been pretty decent to you you've never believed in me but that's because you've never believed in any man i've tried to show you how differently i felt by kissing me she mocked bent changed his tone see here camilla he said i'm not in a mood to be trifled with i can't go away from here and leave you in this god-forsaken hole there isn't a person here fit for you to associate with it will drive you mad in another year do you ever try to picture what your future out here is going to be haven't i bitterly you've seen them out on the ranches haven't you slab-sided gingham scarecrows in sunbonnets 
brown and wrinkled like dried peaches moving all day from kitchen to bedroom from bedroom to barn and back again yes yes said camilla her head in her hands i have seen them without one thought in life but the successes of their husbands the hay crop the price of cattle without other diversion than the visit to kinney the new hat and frock once a year a year behind the fashion their only companions women like themselves with the same tastes the same thoughts the same habits oh god whispered the girl laying a restraining hand on his arm don't go on i can't stand it he clasped her hands in both of his own don't you see it's impossible he whispered you weren't made for that kind of thing your bloom would fade like theirs only sooner because of your fineness you'd never grow like those women because it isn't in you to be ugly but you'd fade early yes she said i know it you can't stay i know just as you know that you were never meant for a life like that you weren't meant for a life like this do you care what becomes of these kids no matter how much chance you give them to get up in the world they'll seek their own level in the end no i can't stay here she repeated the phrase mechanically her gaze afar i've watched you camilla i know for all your warm blood you're no hardy plant to be nourished in a soil like this you need environment culture the sun of flattery of wealth without them you'll wither and i yes i will i could not stand this much longer perhaps it would be better to die than to become the dull sodden things these women are listen camilla he said madly he put his arms around her his pulses leaping at the contact of her body her figure drooped away from him but he felt the pressure of her warm fingers in his and saw the veins throbbing at her throat and temples and he knew that at last she was awakened you must come with me to the east i won't go without you i want you i want to see you among people of your own sort i'll be good to you so gentle so kind that you'll soon forget that there ever was such a place as this his tenderness overpowered her and she felt herself yielding to the warmth of his entreaty do you really need me so much she asked brokenly his reply was to draw her closer to him and to raise her lips to his but she turned her head and would not let him kiss her perhaps through her mind passed the memory of that other kiss only yesterday no i'm afraid of me why of myself life is so terrible so full of meaning i'm afraid yes afraid of you too somewhere deep in me i have a conscience to-day you appeal to me you have put things so clearly things i have thought but never dared speak of to-day you seem to be the only solution of my troubles let me solve them then wait to-day you almost seem to be the only man in the world almost but not quite i'm not sure of you nor sure of myself you point a way to freedom from this perhaps a worse slavery would await me there suppose i married you don't marry me then he broke in wildly what is marriage a word for a social obligation which no one denies but why insist on it the real obligation is a moral one and needs no rights to make it binding i love you what does it matter whether his meaning dawned on her slowly and she turned in his arms her eyes widening with bewilderment as she looked as though fascinated by the horror she read in his words he felt her body straighten in his arms and saw that the blood had gone from her face do i startle you don't look so strangely you are the only woman in the world i am mad about you you know that can't you see look up at me camilla there's a girl in the east they want me to marry of an old line with money but i swear i'll never marry her never 
slowly she disengaged his arms and put the chair between them there was even a smile on her lips you mean that i that you she paused uncertain of her words that i'll stick to you until kingdom come he assented her laugh echoed harshly in the bare room whether you marry the other girl or not i'll never marry the other girl he said savagely never see her again if you say so he took a step toward her but she held up her hand as though warding off a blow one moment she said a calm taking the place of her forced gaiety her voice ringing with a deep note of scorn i didn't understand at first back here in the valley we're a little dull we learn to speak well or ill as we think at least we learn to be honest with ourselves and we try to be honest with others we do not speak fair words and lie in our hearts our men have a rougher bark than yours but they're sound and strong inside she drew herself to her full height a woman is safe in this country with the men of this country mr bent it is only when camilla forgive me i was only trying you i will do whatever you say i she walked to the door rapidly then paused uncertainly leaning against the door jamb and looking down the street will you go she murmured i can't not yet you must at once jeff ray is coming here now what have i to do with him nothing only if he guesses what you've been saying to me i won't answer for him that's all bent looked up with a quick smile and then sat on the nearest desk i suppose i ought to be frightened what jeff is a kind of a uh, bad man isn't he but i can't go now camilla wouldn't be the sporting thing you know i think i'll stay do you mind if i smoke she watched the approaching figure of jeff for a moment irresolutely and then turned indoors of course i can't make you go she said but i have always understood that when a woman expressed a wish to be alone it was the custom of gentlemen you made my going impossible he said coolly don't forget that i'll go after a while but i won't run you've got something to tell jeff ray i prefer to be here when you do it i didn't say i'd tell him she put in quickly i'm not going to tell him now will you go no he sat on a desk swinging one long leg to and fro and looking out of the open door at which the figure of jeff presently appeared the newcomer took off his hat and shuffled it uneasily but his wide stare and a nod to bent showed neither surprise nor ill-humour indeed his expression gave every sign of unusual content he spoke to bent then gazed dubiously toward the teacher's desk where camilla apparently absorbed in her letter looked up with a fine air of abstraction nodded and then went on with her writing looks sort of coolish around here said jeff hope i haven't butted into an experience meeting or anything he laughed but bent only examined the ash of his cigarette and smiled i thought camilla he went on maybe you'd like to take a ride miss Irwin looked up she knew every modulation of jeff's voice his tone was quiet as it had been yesterday but in it was the same note of command or was it triumph she glanced at cortland bent i'm not riding today she said quietly not with bent either that's funny what will people think around here we've sort of got used to the idea of seeing you two out together kind of part of the afternoon scenery so to speak nothing wrong is there bent flushed with anger and camilla marvelled at this new manifestation of jeff's instinct it almost seemed as though he knew what had happened between them as well as though she had told him jeff laughed softly and looked from one to the other with his mildest stare as though delighted at the discovery 
miss irwin rose and put her letter in the drawer of the desk i wish you'd go both of you she said quietly but ray had made himself comfortable in a chair and showed no disposition to move i thought you might like to ride out to the lone tree he said you know uh, mr bent has leased it to me yes he told me what else did he tell you oh i say ray bent broke in i don't see how that can be any affair of yours jeff ray wrapped his quirt around one knee and smiled indulgently doesn't seem so does it bent he said coolly but it really is you see camilla miss irwin and i have been friends a long time as a matter of fact we're sort of engaged jeff gasped the girl the calmness of his effrontery almost if not quite deprived her of speech even if it were true you must see that it can hardly interest i thought he might like to know i haven't interfered much between you two but i've been thinking about you some i thought it might be just as well that mr bent understood before he went away camilla started up stammered began to speak then sank in her chair again bent looked coolly from one to the other there seems to be a slight difference of opinion he said oh we're engaged all right jeff went on that's why i thought i'd better tell you it wouldn't be any use for you to try to persuade camilla that is miss irwin to go to new york with you jeff made this surprising statement with the same ease with which he might have dissuaded a client in an unprofitable deal miss irwin became a shade paler bent a shade darker such intuition was rather too precise to be pleasant neither of them replied bent because he feared to trust himself to speak camilla because her tongue refused obedience oh i'm a pretty good guesser camilla told you she wasn't going didn't she i thought so you see that wouldn't have done at all because i'd have had to go all the way east to bring her back again when we're married of course jeff the girl's voice found at last echoed so shrilly in the bare room that even ray was startled into silence he had not seemed aware of any indelicacy in his revelation but each moment added to the bitterness of miss irwin's awakening bent's indignity had made her hate herself and despise the man who had offered it she thought she saw what kind of wood had been hidden under his handsome veneer she had always known what jeff was made of the fibre was there tough strong and ugly as ever but it was not rotten and in that hour she learned a new definition of chivalry jeff will you be quiet but she went over to him and put her hand on his shoulder and her words came slowly and very distinctly as she looked over ray's head into cortland bent's eyes what mr ray says is true i intend to marry him when he asks me to bent bowed his head as jeff rose the girl's hand in his i reckon that about winds up all your loose ends around mesa don't it bent said jeff cheerfully when are you leaving town illustration i reckon that about winds up all your loose ends around mesa said jeff cheerfully but bent by this time had taken up his cap and was gone end of chapter two